Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us again. Um, I know we were just speaking like two days ago or something. Uh, and as I described at the beginning of the last time we spoke, this is a really big topic to try and condense down into two hour long sessions. So I apologize that I won't be able to go in depth as much as I'd like to or cover necessarily everything that folks are looking for on the call. Um, I thought the Q&A session last time was just really fantastic, but it definitely kind of indicated to me that it would be difficult to try and cover the totality of Marxist political economy in these two hour long slots. So, you know, if you've got questions uh, left over from last time, I hope that they can be answered in this round. Um, I know that we spoke last time mainly about the method behind Marxist political economy and what sets it apart from other types of political economies. Um, we talked about change, we talked about sort of evolution, and we talked a little bit about conflict and how conflict between classes generally is what is considered to be the driving force, the engine of history and also has a huge, obviously, has a huge influence on how things are today. We also talked a little bit about surplus. I think we talked about it in regards to free time, and I'm glad that folks got a lot out of that discussion last time. I've had some people reach out to me and say that, you know, they hadn't thought about free time in that way, but I'm sure it's on everybody's mind right now. Um, especially as we're coming into the holiday season, maybe some people are, are taking breaks from work right now and they realize that, hey, wait a minute, it doesn't feel as relaxing as I thought it would be. So uh, we talked a little bit about that. And so I think today what we're going to do is we are going to start off again with this idea of surplus, right? So surplus isn't just about free time. You know, it's also about money it's housing, it's commodities, and in many situations, it's life itself, right? Surplus, it is what is left over after the production process has completed and all of the costs or all of the things that were owed have been paid off and the surplus is the extra little bit. So we spoke about it last time in terms of grain silos, right? How grain silos were created because for the first time, humanity was able to produce more than they needed to immediately survive. So they had to think about things in the future, right? And they had to plan for the future, and they also had to make decisions based on what they wanted to, the future to look like, right? So that's why we're gonna be talking about surplus today, is because that's actually a huge driving force in Marxist political economy, and really all kinds of economies, and hopefully this will kind of show you how. Right, and sorry, my bullet points are really weird coming up on the screen here. So uh, conflict over surplus results in change. That's also something that's really important to keep in mind uh, as we're talking about surplus and as we're thinking about class too, and as we're thinking about trajectories that sort of go into the future. So because we wanna talk about surplus, we're gonna need to talk about the state, right? Because if surplus results in kinds of conflicts or the separations of different classes, right? You've got the people who make decisions about the surplus, you've got the people who create the surplus themselves, the state is going to be a really important part of how political economy kind of unfolds, right? And it's not as though some people sat around and said, well, you know, we need to have a state, we need to have some sort of form of governance. This was a, a form of governments that actually kind of emerged from human development. And so there's this quote here from Engels, uh, from The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, which is a fantastic book that I would really encourage everyone to read at some point in time. It's a really good, um, in-depth kind of discussion about some of the things we're talking about here, if you haven't read it already, of course. Uh, so the quote is, a product, so the state is a product of society at a certain stage of development, right? So that implies that there were developments before that, right? Um, and maybe didn't include a state. It is the admission that this society has become entangled in an unsoluble contradiction with itself, that it has split into irreconcilable antagonisms, which it is powerless to dispel, right? So we can think about that as the emergence of conflict that is happening over stuff that's relating to surplus, right? Um, 
but in order that these antagonisms, these classes with conflicting economic interests might not consume themselves and society in fruitless struggle, it became necessary to have a power seemingly standing above society that would alleviate the conflict and keep it within the bounds of order. And this power arisen out of society, but placing itself above it and alienating itself more and more from it is the state, right? So let's kind of unpack that quote a little bit more because there's a lot in there. It's really, really rich. Um, this idea that if there isn't something like the state that can try and step in and mediate these conflicts between different classes that are having these, uh, you know, antagonisms over things like surplus or other kinds of economic interests, that what's going to result is sort of a state of, of destruction, like the society itself is going to kind of self-destruct, right? Um, so you have to create this power, right, which arises out of society. So it's not as though people along the historical record actually sat down and said, okay, let's come up with a state. You know, obviously when people are coming up with ideas about states right now and how they look, um, they might take a, a little bit from other types of situations that they thought were a good idea or leave other parts of it out. They can create stuff like a new constitution. Um, but yeah, so this sort of arose out of society and places itself above it, right? And alienates itself more and more from it, meaning that the state is no longer looked at as something that is part of society, but rather something that stands above society. Um, not necessarily that being true, right? Because we understand that you can't just silo out major institutions like the state. The state also exists within society and it also exists within the economy and is subject to changes and conflicts and everything within those two. Um, but it alienates itself from it, right? So people, for instance, now that, you know, COVID-19 has been a huge thing this year, and now that we have the vaccine, we have this Congress, which is arguing about whether or not folks are going to be getting stimulus checks in the mail, among many different other things, right? Uh, these are people who are arguing in the halls of power about whether or not people could get just a little bit of crumbs from the table or you know a little bit bigger of a piece of bread um, and they're sitting there and they're arguing about it and they're negotiating together and i'm sure that you know you could watch any kind of drama about governance and and see all the ins and outs and and you know different tricks and maneuvers that people are playing but meanwhile really i mean the country is 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 kind of falling apart if you think about it there are hundreds of thousands of people who have died there are many millions of people who have lost their jobs uh people are increasingly dealing with awful challenging things that are threatening you know people's lifespans not just because of covid and yet the state doesn't seem to kind of understand that. It's working on kind of a different level with different kinds of things that are, are pushing it in one, one direction or another that might seem a little bit alienated from the rest of society. So that's kind of what I think Engels is meaning by that, right? Is it's not just this physical alienation of saying, well, you know, if you have this pass or that pass, you can go into the floor or you can sit up in the gallery to watch the proceedings but it's also just kind of an emotional or an a mental kind of alienation that takes place as well i think what's important though to to note about the state before we proceed is that this idea that nobody actually sits there and says oh let's come up with a state you know a difference between socialists and anarchists for instance is that there's this idea that one can kind of do away with an institution of the state, whereas the state is something that just sort of naturally arises out of things. I think that folks who maybe had any kind of um, experience in movements like Occupy, you know, which are supposed to be horizontal and collective uh, decision-making processes, that you can see how over time in these sorts of leaderless or horizontal, totally horizontal movements, that there are structures that emerge out of that and that there are sort of hierarchies that emerge out of that as well. Um, that, of course, is not a state, but it's sort of indicative of how these kinds of relations fall into place because humanity has reached this level of societal and economic development, right? So, who is it that runs the show? So, one thing that's important here, and I probably should always introduce this a little bit earlier, uh, is that there's a difference between this idea of the state 
and the idea of a government, right? So the government itself changes, right? We just had an election. Uh, there will be a, more elections in the future and the governments will change, right? Uh, different people will be in power, et cetera. But the state itself is something that doesn't necessarily change when the government itself changes, right? It's not as if everyone suddenly gets fired from the EPA or from the IRS whenever there's a presidential election, right? It's not as though someone has to figure out how to build a military every time there's a new government, right? No, these things, they sustain themselves throughout this kind of election cycle. So that's what we mean by the difference of, of a government and a state there, right? Um, and that there may be different forms of government under capitalism. So for instance, in the United States, we have three branches of government and other countries that are run under a capitalist system, they will also have a different form of government. You know, maybe it's parliamentary, maybe it's participatory, you know, there are many different types of government, but the state itself is generally run on the interest of reproducing the class order, right? So for instance, with the Pentagon or with the IRS, these are things that kind of have a, um, have like a, a, a reason for being, right? And it's not as though that reason for being, which if you are the Pentagon, it's to have a large military with bases all over the planet, that that's necessarily going to change, right? And their institutions are reflective of the class orders and we have lobbyists, we have different contracts. There's already a lot kind of wrapped up in the state that doesn't necessarily change overnight whenever a new government comes into power. And the government itself has to kind of run up against these entrenched institutions within the state when it's trying to make any, any new kinds of changes happen, right? And I think that that, going back to the whole COVID response thing, is you can see that tension there, this, this tension between people needing to do something immediately or needing to do something faster or more drastic, but then kind of running into these already um, entrenched kinds of interests within the state system itself, right? So well, this is why, again, why seizing, you know, in quotation marks and not abolishing the state is such an important part of socialist development, right? It's because you cannot just necessarily vote in um, these kinds of institutions. You have to be able, it's not something that can change with the governments. It has to be something that changes the actual structure of the state itself, right? And just getting rid of the state is not going to abolish the class order. It's not going to abolish all those different interests. You know, even if we were to say, okay, there's no more um, U.S. government tomorrow, people would still be existing who had the previous knowledge or who have already these sorts of access to power in places like the Pentagon or the IRS that would still be around, right? So that's why you kind of need to uh, change the foundation, not just what's built on top of it. And how is it necessarily that the state kind of enforces itself or keeps itself going, right? How is it that it that it remains this kind of entrenched interest? Uh, Lenin has a really great quote from the State and Revolution that I love to read and I will share with you now. Uh, quote, a state arises, a special power is created, special bodies of armed men. And every revolution by destroying the state apparatus shows us the naked class struggle, clearly shows us how the ruling class strives to restore the special bodies of armed men which serve it, and how the oppressed class strives to create a new organization of this kind capable of serving the exploited instead of the exploiters, right? So we can see how much the state relies on these special bodies of armed men if we look at the uprisings that were happening this summer as a result of the murder of George Floyd. There could be a lot of sentiment that was shared from the halls of power as people were saying, you know, Black Lives Matter, there's a problem with the police, all of these things. And yet in New York City anyway, there were more than 3,000 people who were arrested for protesting uh, in New York City for about 20 days between May and June. There were people who had their eyes shot out. There were people who had their arms broken. There were people who were hit by cars. There were all sorts of different things that were happening that were kind of separated out from this uh, show of solidarity or, or what have you that comes from the government or these ideas that something needs to change, right? We can kind of sense that there are two levels here. We can also sense that these special bodies of armed men 
which are not necessarily just the police, it also includes the military and so on, that they kind of operate on a uh, different level of uh, stress maybe than like the government would, because if you don't like what it is that the government is doing, then you can vote them out, you know, and, and vote in new people or what have you, but the police are not necessarily democratically elected and certainly not community controlled, right? So that's why you have these more intense conflicts that are happening around uh, this issue of policing, where you have uh, folks torching police precincts, you have people who are, uh, you know, harrying the police in every way they can. These, this is part of the state, right? This is part of the state that's kind of maintaining its order. And I think what becomes necessary for people who are studying Marxist political economy now, trying to apply it to situations that we're dealing with every day, is how is it that the rallying cry of Black Lives Matter, for instance, or this emphasis on wanting to do away with uh, white supremacy is so deeply threatening to these institutions of power, to these special bodies of armed men. But yes, so this is how the state kind of enforces itself is because at the end of the day, it's not as though someone can just suggest to me what laws I have to follow. The reason why I follow those laws is because I know that if I, if I don't, and if I get caught, or if someone is targeting me, then that means I get, you know, violence done to me. The state has the ability to do that. Likewise, if I am at work and I need to work even harder to not be fired, uh, part of the reason why I'm doing that is because I might be living in a right to work state, right? I might have laws that have been set up that are preventing me from having a union, or I might understand that if I lose my job and I become homeless, that, you know, in a, in a city like New York, but I think most cities across the United States, if not all of them, have to some extent already criminalized homelessness. So I know that not playing by the rules is going to result in the possibility, if not the certainty of me having violence done to me by the state. So the state determines, so to, to go away from the special bodies for a minute, um, the state facilitates and determines the distribution of surplus, right? So when profit is made, when there's more money, when there are more supplies, when there, you know, any anything related to surplus, the state generally facilitates and determines this distribution, right? Uh, in socialist countries like Cuba, the state directs surplus to the vulnerable, giving them more power, right? So I can't think of anything special off the top of my head, but I know, and I would be doing the uh, history of injustice if I were to talk about milk distribution, for instance, right? Uh, if there's a milk shortage in Cuba, they make sure that it goes to the people who are the most vulnerable. In this case, it would be children uh, or people who are pregnant or people who have some sort of illness that needs it, right? And because they are prioritizing people who are in that situation, it gives those people more power in a way, right? Um, because they're not so worried about whether or not they're going to not have the proper amount of calcium, they feel like they're seen in society, et cetera. In capitalist countries like the United States, however, the state directs surplus to the least vulnerable, giving them more power, right? So, and this is just how states are set up under different economic systems. Uh, in the US, we can see that there has been a trajectory towards extreme income inequality over the last several decades. Um, even though, of course, income inequality has always been around, uh, in recent years, we can see that there's almost an approaching exponential um, inequality that's happening in society. And it's not just around wages, right? It's not just around how much money people have. It's also about their access. It's about whether or not their life expectancy is 54 years old as opposed to 81 years old. Um, it seems as though under the system that we live in, People who are rich get more powerful and they also get more surplus, whereas people who are not rich, they actually end up getting less and less every single year, right? So this is one of the ways that the state facilitates and determines this uh, distribution of surplus through tax code, right? Um, if you raise taxes on the rich, then that means that there will be more surplus that is going to people who need it through social welfare programs, but if you give the rich people tax breaks, then that just gives them more money to buy lobbyists, right? Or contribute to political campaigns. And so they can kind of entrench their power by newspapers, for instance, like Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post or Rupert Murdoch, you know, with the Fox empire even. So 
we can see how there's sort of two different trajectories, different ways that the state is handling surplus. But again, this is not a top-down process. It's not as if you can sort of say, well, you know, we're going to elect somebody as a city council person, and they're going to make sure that all of the extra surplus that comes through uh, our district is going to be directed to the, the most vulnerable, right? It's not that easy because the state is already set up and responding to a, a dynamic that exists around class and conflict already, right? So I would sometimes make a joke that, you know, you could elect Karl Marx as president of the United States and not all that much would change because it is reflective of a, a kind of dynamic in society, whether or not Karl Marx could be, well, I guess in that case, things might change a little bit more, but generally the structure itself reflects how class is set up in society, right? And if uh, faced with a threat to the state's integrity, right, if there is some extra conflict that's going on or brewing somewhere, then the state also has the ability to make concessions to one party or the other. Uh, and I mentioned Keynesian era economics here, and this is a photo of uh, John Maynard Keynes, Keynesianism, you know, as sort of being a counter argument to socialism at the time, right? And the post-war, uh, sorry, the post-World War II period, you saw um, people sort of have this boon of wealth, right? And that wasn't just because there was suddenly more money. No, the state was taking very careful um, care sorry, careful care, to distribute surplus to people who are going to possibly cause trouble in the future, right? Now, this Keynesian economic process wasn't perfect at all because we could see that there were problems with especially racial inequality and gender inequality that were built into it, but because the threat of socialism was still there, that's why you had McCarthyism, but you also had this sort of gesture towards labor, right, and saying, well, you know, we'll make sure that income inequality isn't too big and we'll keep it tamped down, and of course it's not until the Soviet Union becomes weaker uh, and then ultimately collapses that you have the income inequality sort of spike again, right? So the state is able through its uh, mechanisms to facilitate and determine the distribution of surplus, but at the same time, the state doesn't exist completely outside of society, right? It's also making the decisions that it makes in response to the present conditions around class conflict. Capitalism requires more and more to sustain itself, and I'm looking at the clock, so I won't, I won't, Dilly dally too much on this slide, but capitalism requires more and more to sustain itself, right? So a business has to turn a profit each year to stay in business, right? To stay above water. Um, you have to have labor plus materials plus overhead. That's going to equal cost coverage plus profit. You have to make that profit happen at the end of the day. Otherwise, you're gonna go out of business, you're either gonna go bankrupt or competition is going to step over you. And competition, when taught about in bourgeois political economy, is supposed to be what drives capitalism, right? Because you want to stay in the market, because you wanna stay in business, you're gonna to have to try and innovate, you're gonna to have to come up with new things, you're gonna to have to figure out new suppliers that are gonna be cheaper than your competitor in order to uh, stay in business and become bigger, right? Because it's sort of a compound process. You have to make more and more profit every single year to stay in business, because if you're not, then the other guy is, right? So this is a, frankly an unsustainable kind of uh, accumulation process, which is why crisis itself is such an integral part of capitalism, right? So financial crises, economic crises, this is something that's extremely natural to capitalism. It puts working people in a lot of pain, um, but for the ruling class, for the capitalist class, they can use it as an opportunity to kind of consolidate more. So if there is a financial crisis and a bunch of businesses go out of business, that means that, of course, the people who stuck around are going to have less competition. But it also means that the entities that stick around are able to sort of snap up new assets. So I think a lot about 2008 right, where you had all of these banks, and I was living in central Florida at the time, and so Wachovia was like the really big bank that was on every single street corner, and after the 2008 crisis, suddenly you saw that, oh goodness, now it's all owned by Wells Fargo, right, so even though Wachovia suffered a lot, um, I mean, ultimately went out of business, 
uh, Wells Fargo was able to step in and kind of snap up those assets, right? Meanwhile, the workers, they don't recover like that, right? If anything, they get things taken away from them even more. Uh, of course, justify the the state or their bosses justify it with the crisis. I know that already there are lots of unions that are having to deal with management that says, well, you know, it's because we have this terrible financial crisis going on that we need to cut your wages or something like this. And it's not like those wages are going to come back when business is any better unless there's some sort of push, there's some sort of conflict that uh, continues and sort of gives labor that that leg up again, right? So crisis for some bourgeois economists, they'll say, well, you know, it's cyclical. It's something that happens. It, it clears the market. It gets all of the bad, you know, actors out of the market, although we could see from 2008 that a lot of the bad actors are still in business, if not even more powerful. But crisis is not something like endless crisis or, or increasingly larger crises. They're not something that can be sustainable. So expansion here we'll come back to crisis in a second but expansion so as compound profit is necessary compound expansion also becomes necessary right so you have this competition and you need to stay in business and all of your competitors are figuring out new ways to you know get cheaper materials or have access to cheaper labor and so you also are going to have to go out and and find that if you're a capitalist which i don't think there are any on the call but Compound expansion becomes really extremely necessary uh, the more crises you sort of encounter. And new markets also become really essential. This is how colonialism and imperialism come into play, right? There's this idea of, well, if we go to different countries and we take their stuff, right? We take their really wonderful things out of the ground or we force their wonderful labor force to you know, work for almost no money and we do it under threat of violence or we do it through you know setting up a new kind of state um you know that that way you get cheaper goods back to the imperial core and you can create commodities for a cheaper price uh and hopefully put your competitors out of business right but this kind of expansion comes in an extremely terrible price right you have resource grabbing you have people uh, sorry, not people, but you have governments that send their trash to different countries to have those other countries take care of it, send nuclear waste to other countries to have them take care of it, while at the same time taking things um, out of those countries that are really, really valuable. Uh, not just things like resources that you can hold in your hands, but stuff like uh, educated people, right? Um, there's something called brain drain, where you see sometimes the most educated people in a society decide well you know they can't make as much living in wherever they were and so they're going to emigrate to another country and make money there uh, that's also a form of kind of resource grabbing if you think about it but pulling away from this i you know international sphere you can also see that things are becoming commodified that weren't commodified beforehand right and if this class were longer if we had several sessions together i could go more into this concept of enclosure and this idea that you would have had something that you never thought you could put a price on or that someone can make a profit off of but someone is going to figure out how to do that uh, facilitated by the state or facilitated by existing class tensions and that's going to result in stuff like you know facebook for instance i mean facebook is something that people use to feel like they're staying in touch with their family and friends and every time someone clicks a like or spends you know any amount of time on those websites these large corporations are making money off of the fact that people want to stay in touch with their family and friends and yeah you could say well you know you had that with the mail or you could do that with the phone company and stuff but i don't feel like I mean, I'm old enough that I lived without smartphones for a while, and I don't think I ever spent that much time on the internet before it became broadband, right? Uh, and so as technology kind of advances, so too do the opportunities for this kind of expansion and commodification. You now have the ability to, well, you know, the florist downstairs, and I'm cribbing this from, from something that uh, David Harvey once said, where, you know, you'll have a florist in New York City, and the flowers that they're selling are actually grown in Latin America. And they have been put on a plane 
put in some sort of ice or preservative and then flown to New York City where somebody there unpacks it and, and sells it to you. So that kind of technology was not available, um, I think, until extremely recently, globalization heralded this opportunity for people to be able to communicate and network, but it also heralded this opportunity for logistics to work, right? For network systems to be able to calculate who, uh, sorry, how long it would take to get goods places, how many goods were needed in certain places, and then sort of fulfill that. We can look at Walmart, right, or any kind of big box store as being a manifestation of this technological advance, but also this desire for expansion, right, because Walmart can somehow figure out exactly what needs to be on the shelves at some store somewhere and then have it there in like two days. Amazon itself is a logistics system. It's not as though Amazon really necessarily sells anything except for the ability to get you things through the mail really quickly. Um, and so, yeah, as this expansion happens, so we will also see technology uh, developing and then also things becoming commodified that might not have before been commodified, right? And there's a lot to think about in that regard, but crises may be advantageous, as I spoke a little bit about on the last slide, in terms of being able to concentrate more capital, sorry, advantageous to capital. It's, it's, it's advantageous as in people could consolidate more, um, but as a whole, it's not sustainable, right? And it's not hard to think about why, not just on like an economic uh, front of saying, well, you know, how many times can you throw people on the unemployment line throughout a course of their lifetime, but also just speaking frankly about the planet. Um, but before we move on to that part real fast, I just want to say that the bourgeois state is just absolutely key in facilitating capital, both on the domestic and in the international level. And I kind of put these things side by side so you could see how they're connected. Um, so on the domestic level, we have stuff like labor laws and environmental laws, right? Depending on uh, how much power labor has, wherever they are, the labor laws and environmental laws are going to be different, right? So it used to be that children very young children would work in mines because of conflict and because of class pressure they were able to outlaw child labor but you know there are people in power who are like no we think child labor could work environmental law is kind of the same thing uh, but the state itself is kind of there to decide whether or not someone is going to dump a bunch of pollution in a river right and they're going to back that up again with their special bodies of armed men and their courts and the actual physical force that they have to enforce that Internationally, you have things like trade agreements, right, between different countries. And depending, again, on the balance of power and on the class uh, forces at play is how those trade agreements are going to look, right, or treaties, for instance. Um, for domestic, we have prisons and ice camps, which are held as sort of this cudgel to keep people in line. Uh, internationally, though, if you step out of line, you look like you're going to have people, states can wage war against each other or fund coups. Um, they can, you know, countries like the United States can place military bases around the world uh, to protect assets, basically. I mean, if you look at how many military bases, uh, U.S. military bases are in the world and it's something around 800 or more that we know about, there's no reason for most of these military bases to be out there, you know, to protect the United States. It's more just to kind of protect uh, the business interests of the United States, right? So this is how the, the state can facilitate in that way. But in both, you kind of have this dynamic of extraction and subjugation. You know, how much is it that capital can take out um, and how well can these powers kind of subjugate whoever it would be that stands in the way, whether that there are people who are working or people who are heads of state in other parts of the world that are standing in the way of you know, continued extraction, right? So I think a lot about Bolivia, when you had Elon Musk say that you know, there was a coup basically so he could have cheaper lithium uh, against Evo Morales. And of course, you know, thank goodness that the, that the class dynamics are still at play there and that you know, that's not necessarily supposed to be the case. But yes, so you can see how it plays out at the domestic and the international level in that regard. But capitalism ultimately creates a world where nobody wins. And this is kind of what I was meaning by crisis is, is not sustainable over time, this kind of expansion and this kind of exploitation and extraction and subjugation. It's not sustainable over time. Uh, the planet just can't deal with it, right? We cannot 
there there's an it's not an infinite resource the planet right and i think that folks nowadays are a little bit more aware of that than they were but think about how things were 150 years ago when capitalism was was getting steam i mean people didn't think at all about what they were putting into the air um and to be more profitable you're going to need to consume more things and take more things out of the ground and it's just it's not infinite you know and likewise human beings are not infinite if your boss wants you to work harder for less money uh he can't work you 24 hours a day you know you have to be able to eat and sleep and take care of yourself uh and this is part of why the state exists is to try and mitigate these circumstances you know to make sure that capitalism doesn't work everyone to death or that you know all things aren't poisoned that come out of the ground or the air uh, but at the same time, because the state is kind of subject to these class conditions, the state itself is not always going to make the wisest decisions for sustainability, which I think everyone on the call can probably testify to in one way or another, their own special circumstances. Social reproduction is difficult to sustain under increasingly difficult conditions, right? So covid being a really excellent example you can look at how some countries like china uh, korea cuba etc were able to handle the covid 19 crisis and how little the united states was prepared to to do that you actually saw a fight over whether or not people should be forced to go back to work in the middle of a pandemic you had you know elected officials on tv saying that well my grandmother would be happy to die for for capitalism and I, I don't think you can make that call for everybody's grandmother. Uh, but regardless, social reproduction becomes strained under these kinds of conditions, right? It's hard for a lot of people to consider starting families at moments like this, not just with the pandemic, but with the financial situation, with the way that things are going. Uh, it becomes increasingly difficult. People have to deal with a lot more they lose more, they have less free time, but they also have less material resources with which to like reproduce themselves or reproduce their communities. But at the same time, as it becomes more and more difficult for us, you know, workers to be able to sustain ourselves and to reproduce ourselves, it becomes increasingly difficult for structures of power to reproduce themselves under these kinds of conditions. I mean, the planet is not infinite, right? COVID-19, you can't just pretend like it doesn't exist. It definitely exists. Um, and as people are forced more and more into a corner, those sorts of potentials for conflict keep on getting stronger and more intense. And as we learned a little bit in the last class, but we can touch on here again, that kind of conflict is going to result in change, right? So as conditions become more difficult, there is going to be more conflict and that conflict is going to spur some sort of change, right? Again, yeah, it's inevitable. Like you cannot have that kind of situation or a situation like you see in this photo, you cannot have the planet falling apart and human beings themselves falling apart and not expect anything to change out of that, right? I mean, it, does it make sense? It's not historical. It's not based in reality. If people get demoralized and say, well, you know, things will always be this way, it, it just can't. It's, it's physically impossible for that to happen. That's not to say things can 100% get better. That's why people have to actually struggle and fight and get involved in their communities. Um, but change is definitely going to happen. Things cannot be as they are indefinitely. So, that kind of brings me to this point again of this this liberatory potential of marxist political economics this idea that a better world is possible you know um trajectories and change as i said they can either be unfavorable you know things can get worse or they can get better right and it's up to us uh, to be able to turn each pushback into an opportunity, right? So yes, it's terrible that the world is being poisoned. However, more and more people being affected by it, being affected by this poisoned planet, uh, spurs change, right? Uh, I cannot imagine how exhausted people are um, watching police murder after police murder after police murder, how sickened people are, and yet, people becoming sickened of it is the way that people say that they're fed up and they start to struggle. Um, so yes, every pushback offers an opportunity. It opens a conversation. It opens possibilities. 
each failure can be a lesson, right? So if we have somebody like Trump in office for four years, we can sit down and really use Marx's political economy to examine the conditions in which he came into power and what it was that he did and how to avoid those sorts of outcomes again, but not just about the electoral part of it, but what does it represent to the capitalist class that someone like him is in power, you know? What does it mean about the trajectory of things? It's a lesson that people can, can you know, learn from because history repeating itself just doesn't happen, right? Um, and this also this need to stay focused and adjust tactics when necessary, right? Um, we can use Marxist political economy to sort of step back and think about what is what is our goal? You know, is our goal a world where the planet isn't poisoned or where everyone is treated with dignity and everyone's needs are met and children aren't homeless, they don't starve, you know, people don't die from easily preventable diseases, you know, we can all have a better hope for ourselves, we can raise families, et cetera. Keeping our eyes on that prize and understanding the dynamics that keep us from being able to live those sorts of lives is a way for us to, to plot, right? Or to plan um, and also adjust our tactics when necessary, right? So one thing might work in one place at one time, but we need to not think that that's gonna work every single time in every single place, right? Marxist political economy gives us the tools to be able to do that. Um, and so, yeah, that's the end of the slideshow. And thank you for sitting in as I tried to slam through all sorts of information about political economy into one hour session. So thank you very much for joining me. Okay, we'll open the floor now for uh, comments and questions. If you'd like to introduce a comment or raise a question, please uh, click the picture of, your, of the hand on your control panel. Click the raised hand icon to indicate you want to uh, speak to introduce uh, a question or comment. Raphael uh, Beaumont, your mic is open. Okay, <clears throat> hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't get the name of, of our speaker. I'm really sorry. What's your name? My name is Taryn. Karen, hi, Karen, Raphael, I'm sorry. I joined in late. Listen, my question is, Thank you for a wonderful presentation. My question is, do, is there a book that you recommend as a primer, as a beginning book, uh, so we can start uh, studying uh, the Marxist political economy and in a crystal clear way, the way you just described it? Because the description that you gave and also the analysis of capitalism that you gave is crystal clear. Is there a book or, or, or an article an academic article that you can recommend? Thank you. Okay, let's take a few more uh, comments or questions. Thank you, Raphael. Um, I'm looking for raised hands. You, you indicate you want to speak uh, by clicking the picture of the hand on your control panel and we will scroll through and open up your mic on our end. Keith, uh, your mic is open. Click your mic on your control panel to open it on your end. Use your mouse, hover over the mic. Yeah, there you are. Speak oh, up. So Speak Sorry. up, please. Can you hear me? Uh, better, better. Okay. Uh, my question is um, uh, the possibility of impending uh, fascist state in the U.S. If you could comment on that. Okay, let's take, thank you. Let's take, uh, Kevin, your mic is open. Kevin Horton, your mic is open. Thank you. Um, I need to adjust my controls. Give me a second. Uh, da, ba, um. We hear you. Please speak. Okay. Oh, okay. Cool. I had my machine muted. Sorry. Um, I was. Thank you. I was wondering if there was a downloadable 
copy of this presentation that I can get? Everyone who registered will receive uh, the recording through email. Everyone who registered will receive the link for the recording uh, from Sunday night and the and the link uh, for the recording tonight. Jake, your uh, mic is open. Please click, click your, there you are. Hi there, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering um, your best perspective on what we can do locally to invoke a better presence in our community from a Marxist uh, like viewpoint, um, like how we can better help our community. That's all, thank you. So maybe you want to um, respond to the set of questions you have so far, Terry? Sure, oh, I'm not muted, great. Um, yeah, no, I can do that um, to kind Unless of work. Unless you want to take more. Um, I, I see another hand. Let's take one more and then I'll and then I'll answer. That'd be great. Okay. Brighton, your mic is open. Click uh hover over your mic. There you are. Yes. Um thank uh thank you for handing the mic over, moderator, and thank you, Taryn, for the pleasure of taking this time for this heavily informative webinar. I just have a comment, and this is what I've summarized through the middle of the presentation. Regarding your slides on technological advancement and how corporations, specifically Amazon, take advantage of those with their services can also supply basic necess necessities on their own steam, like uh, Amazon basics with clothes or living essentials for those on low income. Uh, but the way they produce their necessities and commodities in the same lieu of Elon Musk taking advantage of Bolivia with their coup can be argued in defense of Marxism by arguing that the ethical production of commodities is heavily taken advantage of, like the modern American worker. But the way they produce their commodities for the average consumer in the same way American brand, brand, how brands in America is it's basically sweatshop since you know a lot of clothes that and products are like made in Vietnam with poor labor laws in Taiwan and with you know trade agreements with China and how would they produce their how corporations produce their commodities in those low labor countries it, it, it's, it's just sweatshop and that's just my comment on it but thank you thank you thank you moderator Okay, Taryn. Yeah, so just to speak to Brighton's point, you know, I am not anti-technology at all. I'm very pro-technology. I mean, I don't like all of it, you know, I don't want all of it in my house, I don't want all of it in my life, but the reason for that usually is because I know who it is that's making a profit off of it, right? Um, I think that it's absolutely incredible and a real testament to human ingenuity that we can source items from different parts of the planet um, to appear somewhere else, right? And I'm saying we, it's where I obviously can't do this, you know, you can't do it, I'm assuming, um, but that the technology and the logistics infrastructure exists to be able to do that, right? I think that's incredible. What I want to see out of, out of my lifetime or my struggle or wherever you know the trajectory is taking us is that those things are put into the hands of folks who want to uh, do better for the world right i think it's a, a great thing that we can centrally that it, it, it's a possibility of central planning right it's a possibility of central planning that we didn't necessarily see 50 60 70 years ago right this idea of a centralized network that can decide where things need to go how to get things from one place to another that's really incredible that's awesome human technology i think that the problem is as you said is this idea of sweatshops right and the sweatshops come out of this uh, absolute necessity for profit and it's impossible to completely change those circumstances of where people are working if people are held to this sort of profit standard right if capitalists are still in charge and calling all of the shots but using the things the incredible new kinds of technologies that have been created um, for the benefit of our class, I'm all for that. So, 
you know, appreciate your point on that front. Uh, to Jake's question on how to better help the community, that's a pretty big question because I don't know what community you're in. Um, but, you know, I think that you can always look around and see what kinds of groups to become involved with that you can sign up to try and do better for your community. Right now, if you walk around outside, if you're taking your, your walk to get outside in the middle of a pandemic, um, you can see postings on, on light posts for people who are helping other folks in their communities. Um, you can look on online, you can read, you know, the news, paper, you can look at people's world, you can figure out where people are getting involved in their community and sign up for that. If you're trying to ask me that question as, you know, from perspective of what does the community need, you know, that takes a lot of investigation and you can do that through uh, central databases like the Census or the Bureau of Labor Statistics if you wanted to get into that and see, you know, what industries people are working in, uh, which areas of what community you're in are underserved. Uh, that need help, you can do that. But I would really just recommend trying to hook up with people who have already been helping out in the community and, and see what's going on there um, and seeing how it is that you can plug in with that regard. Um, downloadable presentation, D, you touched on that already. Uh, the, the prospect for a fascist state in the United States, that was the question that was asked, whether or not that's possible, I think. Um, and of course it's possible what is fascism you know there are a couple books you can read about that but there is a really good book by an author named michael roberto that was published i think in 2018 maybe it was 2019 um called the coming of the american behemoth which sort of examines the tendency of monopoly capital in the united states to gain power uh and that's a really interesting sort of look at what happened during the great depression the roaring 20s into the great depression and into the new deal it's an interesting and very critical look at that uh, but also talks about what kinds of uh, structures culturally have been set up in u.s society that would lead the u.s into a fascist kind of situation and that would be of course uh, racial capitalism right this idea of white supremacy and um, people of certain um, ethnic backgrounds being open for hyper exploitation, their lives not being worth as much as other people's lives. Uh, that's a very important foundational aspect of fascism, but also this lionization of the businessman, right? This idea that Bill, uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and all of these people were somehow able to get where they were because of their own hard work and ingenuity. This idea even of Trump as sort of this businessman leader i mean that's a very dangerous kind of dynamic uh, you could also say the same thing with michael bloomberg in new york city you know that those are sorts of fascist archetypes in the, in the waiting there even if michael bloomberg is running as a democratic you know presidential candidate um so there is you know a lot that you could read about that is it possible i mean yeah of course it's possible um are there already like fascistic elements that are existing in the in the united states absolutely for sure you know, you can look at ICE, you know, or you can look at the Department of Homeland Security or, or how these sorts of state violent apparatuses already exist to uh, threaten any kind of uh, progressive working class struggle. Uh, you can see it pretty plainly there, the way that, you know, cops get away with killing people. It's it's very plainly, that's that's very much a fascistic kind of tendency, right? This idea that the armed wing of the state cannot be held accountable for whatever it wants to do. And the fact that it basically reinforces this thing called racial capitalism at every turn, that's also like a fascistic tendency. So, but yeah, of course it's possible. Um, would it look like fascism out of Italy or Nazi Germany? No, I mean, of course not. If we're looking at Marxist political economy, then we understand that each situation is very, very different and that the environment and the times and previous things that happened are going to change the way that these sorts of things manifest in time, right? Like you can't have um, one standard thing that's just gonna repeat itself as if it's sort of embedded in your DNA. No, that's not how it works. But, but yeah, Marxist political economy can be a helpful tool for trying to kind of determine that. Uh, as for book recommendations for clear explanations, I would honestly want to 
maybe um, talk with D or something about putting together a list that folks could look at if they want to have sort of a practical introduction um, or a little bit deeper understanding of Marxist political economy. It's a big thing. So, you know, are you wanting to look at colonialism? Are you wanting to look at gender? Are you wanting to look at imperialism? What is it exactly? Labor? There's a lot that you could kind of dig into. But as for the method of it precisely, you know, I would I would want to give it a little bit of thought. I think that my understanding of Marxist political economy has come from a lot of different sources. It's come from a lot of different books. But without being able to take those things that I learned in books and sort of work through them outside of a book, like in the in the world, you know, as a as a union organizer, as for somebody who's working with with refugees or, or whatever someone who's who's teaching university classes in New York City, all of these things inform my understanding of Marxist political economy just as much as me reading a book about it. So in the first session, I'd sort of said, well, you know, you could read a lot of books about it. You could, you know, uh, attend a lot of lectures. But once you kind of get the gist of it, you get the dynamic of it, which is historical materialism, dialectical materialism, how that interacts with things like surplus and human development, technological advances, then you have the ability to sort of take Marxist political economy and apply it to many, many different things in different circumstances, because it's supposed to be kind of like a living thing, right? Like you're supposed to be able to take something that this German dude wrote, you know, hundreds of years ago and apply it to nowadays with our just in time kind of logistic systems and Facebook and Zoom and all of these different things, you're supposed to be able to take it and apply it uh, wherever you can. So, but yeah, I can I can speak with Dee about a reading list if that would be helpful for folks. Okay, we are at the top of the hour. On behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank Taryn for uh, participating in this two class uh, session. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of the participants. As I indicated before, each uh, person who has registered will receive a link to the recording for the first session and uh, the recording for this session uh, as well. So again, Taryn, thank you. Um, and to everyone, uh, Happy holidays, uh, be careful, be safe, and uh, go Georgia. Good night. Thank you, bye.